Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in tonight to this super special episode. Um, it actually was supposed to be a fundraiser show, but um, it is way more of a thank you show. I am still completely floored by your kindness. I thought um, it was going to take at least a month or two um, to reach the goal, but your kindness has just overwhelmed me. Um, so tonight is definitely more of a thank you show. Um, so my co-hosts are going to be um, people who are we do shows with all the time. Uh, Mr. Mike Figueredo from Humanist Report and Mr. Ron Placone from Get Your News On with Ron. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Sorry, my earpiece fell out as I raised my hand. <laughs> <laughs> So I, the reason why I asked both of you is because I have had many people on independent media on my show. I've been on many shows, but there are no other independent media people who have been more supportive than you two. Um, and you two are ones I consider friends, not just fellow streamers, but actual friends. Um so I thought it was, you know, it just made me so happy that you both were were down to help out tonight. Um, so I guess, you know, what we're going to do first is we're going to, oh, well, first, okay, I'll say in honor of Ron, uh, happy 420. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a big day. It's a big day. It's a, it's a big day. And um, I, I got some edibles lined up after this. You're gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna you know, you know what I'm gonna do. Actually, uh, Joy, you. I, I don't know if everyone else will appear, but Joy, you'll probably appreciate this. I'm, I'm going to uh, take an edible after this, and then I'm going to watch that um, that controversial uh, sort of so-called controversial uh, Simpsons episode that features the Smiths. Oh, I haven't, I haven't watched it yet. I don't know if you've watched it, but I've not watched it yet. Not um, yet, but I saw a clip and I was like, "Ooh, yeah, <laughs> I'm curious." So I'm gonna watch it. And, and hey, Mike, I actually got something for you too. This is this is a cat toy in my hand. I don't know <gasps> if you can. Yeah. This okay. Is, I keep this is like my ledge that my wife in in the in the Zoom world we live in. My wife now refers to this as my stage, which I refer to it as well too. Basically, it's a big cutting station in the kitchen that I've made into a makeshift stage. And I always keep this cat toy on hand because sometimes Lucy just decides, hey, I'm making a cameo and she'll jump <laughs> off. So I have something to like, like, especially if it's like a stand up show where there's like other comics, I'm just kind of waiting for my turn. I can mute myself when I need to and just play with my cat before my set. So that's yeah, actually brilliant. Gives me the butt. She gives you the butt. See, I, I, I'm so jealous of Lucy because whenever I try to bring my cat on any of my Twitch streams, she knows that I'm coming and she runs and hides. She's not social <laughs> like Lucy is. So it's like, what, what, how can Lucy train my cat to be more um, or, or to be less camera shy? Because I really like Lucy is one of a kind, I feel like. She, yeah, she's never shied away from the camera. I mean, she's had television appearances before and stuff. She doesn't care. That's amazing. She, so, yeah. So, so I don't know if they ever meet. The, what's your cat's name again? Svetlana. Russian name. Svetlana. Yeah, so probably a bad Lucy, idea. They gotta, they gotta exchange ideas. Yes, is it, your yes. dog is <laughs> Vladimir. My dog's name is Vladimir, and my cat's name is Svetlana. And I will say, um, I named my dog Vladimir before any of the Russia uh, hysteria stuff. Um, now I'm realizing in hindsight that that was probably a bad idea because this is like ammunition for uh, liberals to say that I'm like a Russian asset. But I got my cat afterwards. So I'm like, listen, I'm keeping with the Russian theme because now it's just a funny meme. Uh, but yeah, my dog's name is literally Vladimir Pugin because he's a pug. So Vladimir Pugin. Um, and yeah, yeah. Cat Svetlana. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> just like I'm asking for it. I know I'm asking for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys again so much for joining us tonight. Um, so we the easiest way um, to share my story, because it is so emotional for me to share, the easiest way to do it is just to show um, my appearance on the Force the Vote town hall. Whether you agree with Force the Vote or not is moot. That's not what this is about. Um, this is just a video of the first time I told my story publicly. 
um, the first time I ever said the word disabled uh, about myself. And also after this, I literally had hundreds of disabled people reach out to me um, with their stories. So this is a, a very powerful moment um, because it was it was new to me. So um, as I said, regardless if you're forced to vote or not, put that aside. This is just the easiest way for me to share my story is to just play it. Oz, if you can Dory share that. Marie Mann, who is the host of Unruly Hour with Savage Joy. And Scott DeNoyer, who is a father, uh, who is a and an organizer, and has a very um, sad and inspiring story to tell. So, welcome, Scott Thank and Joy. You so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, yes. Just wanted to give each of you the opportunity to share why this is an important issue for you. Um, maybe we could start with you, Joy, and then um, with you, Scott. So I am so nervous. I actually wrote down <laughs> what I'm going to say because I was like, I apologize, but I'm usually much more organic. Katie, you've been on my show, you know, but I'm nervous. So I'm just going to read it. <laughs> oh, don't apologize. Um, thank you so much for giving me the honor of speaking tonight with so many incredible people. Um, Ryan Knight, I love you with all my heart. I am told that you gave up your spot so that me and Scott can talk. So thank you. That means so much. And it proves that you are 100% about the issues. Um, so my name is Joy Marie Mann, um, otherwise known as Savage Joy. I am in Harrisburg area, Pennsylvania. Um, some of you may know me from the Unruly Hour, as Katie said, um, and uh, co-author of the parody book about resistors, The Yas Queen Chronicles, which Miss Bree is in. <laughs> if you want to learn more, you can listen to Nina Turner's most recent podcast, in which we discuss how my disability, um, how I overcame that to co-author a book. Um so in any case, um, I'm speaking to you today, not just as someone in independent media, but as someone who also became unexpectedly disabled. Uh, one night I went to sleep like normal and I woke up with most of my eyesight gone. I thought perhaps I was still sleeping I was completely disoriented and told my husband to hand me my glasses. I put them on and realized absolutely no change. Mm. There was, um, it was like I just suddenly put on a blindfold. I was completely, you know, confused um, and overwhelmed. I struggled to get dressed and my husband took me to the hospital. It was there I was diagnosed with a rare disorder named myopic degeneration. Since 2019, my entire life has changed. There was no progression of losing my sight. It was literally overnight. To say it's been traumatic is an understatement of epic proportions. I lost my job, which was unfortunately legal because I was a contractor. And I went from typing 52 words per minute to 21 with mistakes, um, which was one of the reasons they let me go. I have worked in healthcare for over 10 years, ironically. Um, I stopped being able to do many of the things I love. I was an English major and now find myself unable to read books. For instance, things such as, as simple as trying to put a pen cap on a pen will send me into ugly crying because of frustration. It takes many times to do things that we've all done so many times so thoughtlessly 
Um, I'm constantly walking into things and fall down a lot. Um, my life has been uprooted completely in January, despite everything. I decided to move from Pennsylvania to Iowa to uh, for five weeks to campaign for Bernie Sanders. It was a struggle in so many ways. I'm not allowed to drive. I only knew one person. I'd never been to Iowa. And yet somehow I was convinced I could go, still go door to door in four degrees with ice and snow. I think a lot of it was denial, but those five weeks taught me that I can still do some of the things I want to. I bring this up because one of the highlights of those five weeks was meeting Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. I tried to tell her how much her fight for Medicare for all meant to me, but my words couldn't escape as I cried. Rashida grabbed my hands and she cried with me. I told her I was terrified of what I was going through and how much more my sight was worsening. She embraced me and we held hands for minutes. It meant so much to have some hope restored by someone I respect so much. So I guess my question to Rashida is, are you the same person who cried with me? <laughs> and held my hands as we discussed the need for Medicare for all. Since Iowa, I've had eye injections, which cost over $12,000 each. I get them each eyes every 30 days. And I've had two eye surgeries, which even with insurance leaves me thousands in medical debt. Not to mention a $5,000 deductible, which starts again in a day. In addition to myopic degeneration, I have a detached retina, which had surgery for, and it didn't take, so I had to have it again. And cataracts. I, ideal eyesight is 2020. Mine is 2024, or 202400. I was visually impaired, then legally blind, and now I'm visually disabled, all within less than a year. I do not share this to scare you. What happened to me is very rare, but I do share it with you because it's important to realize that while you may not need Medicare for all today, you very well may need it tomorrow on top of having your life turned upside down when becoming disabled, why the hell should everything be exacerbated by things like pre-authorizations and medical bills and countless insurance phone calls? Something I've never personally shared publicly is the despair and deep depression, which comes from becoming disabled. The feeling of being broken and feeling like you're a burden because suddenly you need to ask for help for the littlest things. And sometimes when you go to bed, hoping you just don't wake up the next morning, my question to Ro Khanna is, are you the same person I interviewed on my show four times who continuously supported Medicare for all? Are you the same Ro who shared my post about my medical needs and my b medical bills and said it's unacceptable? My question to AOC is, are you the same person who I interviewed on my show who told me that you're an activist? and would always fight for Medicare for all? 
We may not be your constituents, but make no mistake, we got you elected. You uh, campaigned as an activist. You showed pictures of shoes with holes in them, saying how much you campaign. You said you were of the people. Where are those activists now? Uh, I can't comprehend how their trepidation of pissing off people who already loathe you, people like Pelosi, who you refer to as Mama Bear, who have done nothing but insult you, belittle you, and block you. Why are you worrying about what she of all people thinks? She already knows how she feels, and she will not be swayed. Do I still have everybody? I'm still here, if you can uh, hear me. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, I, I think. We're getting jammed. Mm. Hold on. Let's see if we can get it back going. Isn't that the weirdest thing? Yeah. All right. Hold on. It's coming back up. Let me know when we're back on. I see green lights. Yeah. Hopefully that's, that's a good, good sign. Yeah, that's good. Let me bring you guys back in there. All right, guys. I think you're back. Let me check. Sorry, guys. A little tech issues, but we will be <laughs> hopefully able to play the last two or three minutes or, or whatever it is. Joy Marie Mann. There is no doubt the establishment knows about force the vote, and they're waiting to give cheers with their mimosas. If you disregard those of us you have always said you are one with, some people love to say it won't pass anyway, but they're missing the point. Whether it passes or not, this weekend is important because if we stand up and fight, for it, that is also a victory. If it was a bad strategy, Pelosi would have already done it. As someone who has become disabled, it is frustrating to see people who say they have no medical bills and no medical needs say forcing the vote now is not the time. What makes you think you can speak for those of us who have those pains right now? We have, or excuse me, we have a president-elect who couldn't care less. We have a president-elect president who said he would veto Medicare for all if it came across his desk. We have the man who made Medicare for all a household term and wrote the damn bill who's been shafted yet again. And... So give us something. Give us some bit of hope. We have nothing but each other right now. And I would love to say the people in power aren't as stronger as the power of the people. But is that the case if you guys can't even stand up and be the activist that you say you are? You need to choose your loyalty. Is it the people who constantly disrespect you or is it the people who got you elected? We fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. We fight for those who are hurting. We fight for the hopeless. We fight for a healthier tomorrow. Never ever lose your sense of outrage and you're damn right, force the fucking vote. Thank you. Oh, that's the first time I watched that back. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, that was very, very powerful. Um, yeah. It's what you've gone through is something that is it, it's so unthinkable, so unimaginable. And I, I, I just want to commend you because it's so hard to share something like that and get really personal about it. You know, it's it's tough. So I really applaud you for being brave because 
it's this is not easy yeah it was it was crazy and uh, you know the the fact that you know there there wasn't anyone uh with medical needs speaking on the town hall um and i told ryan knight about it and i said you know this is not right it's a town hall on medicare for all they should have someone i never said that it should be me ever and next thing i know i get a message from nick brana who says hey we'd like you to speak you and scott and i was just like frozen i was like oh my god like i've never even said the word disabled before and here I am. And I, you know, it was just, it was like an out of body experience. And then I looked at the numbers afterwards and it was like, oh, like 140,000 people watched. Is that all? Okay. Um, so it was daunting, but at the same time afterwards, I was so proud. Like I was so proud. Um, that I finally it's like it's like coming out of a closet of sorts it's like look I'm finally gonna say it I became disabled I'm finally going to say that word so in a way it was kind of freeing to actually you know take that step mm -hmm. um so yeah that was that was a <laughs> definitely a, a hard night but then you know hearing brother Cornell after me talking about my story and, and stuff like that. I was like, this is surreal. <laughs> this is it, it was such a powerful, I mean, I watched the whole thing and, and I thought everybody did an, an excellent job and, and you did an excellent job, Joy. I, I cried multiple times. Yours was one of them. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of that whole thing, I, I felt, I mean, it was just a very emotional night I, for everyone involved and everyone watching where, where we really felt, you know, it, it was heavy and, and you really, you know, felt people's stories and, and it hit you. And you also, you, you realized now is the time and it's so inexcusable that we're just decades behind the rest of the industrialized world. And, and when you say it, 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 it hits home hard enough as it is. But then when you really you know, take off another layer, peel the onion a bit further, and you see what that really means. What's it really mean that we're decades behind and how it affects people? It, it's just, it, it's overwhelming. It really is. Absolutely. Mike, would you like to add anything? Uh, no, I just want to say that I think that part of the reason why that story is is so powerful is because you, you kind of explained like you likened it to coming out. And I think that's exactly it because part of, Part of what helps us cope with these terrible situations is accepting it. And you can tell, like, as you were explaining your situation, that almost for the first time, like, when I don't know if you practiced beforehand, but saying it out loud is like your actual definitive acceptance of your situation. And now you're on to the living portion. How do I live going forward? What do I do? And there's something inherently beautiful in the fact that you can see, no, I'm fighting. Now I'm fighting. Uh, I, I accept it. I'm disabled. This is the way that it is. This is the card, uh, you know, this the uh, deck that I was dealt. And now what am I going to do about it? And you, you could see like all of these emotions really culminate in your speech right there, which is why it was so it was so phenomenal. And I think that's why it spoke to so many people, because you feel like it's you could feel it through the screen. Thank you so much. I think I had never said I, I didn't, you know, my husband was at work, so I just kind of stream of consciousness and and so it definitely was the first time i was ever saying those words and and i think you're right it was you know it is so much and and you know i encourage the disabled uh community to to watch so i'm sure they can identify with this you know it's a grieving process it is literally you know like grieving bargaining you know acceptance there's those five steps um, it is, it's a death in some ways, your, your body, the way it used to be and the life, the way it used to be is now transitioned onto a completely different being. Um, so you have to have that grieving process in order to be able to continue. Um, and, and that night I had that acceptance, which I, I wasn't sure if it was ever going to come, you know, so 
Um, I, I'm just forever thankful to, to Ryan, of course, for uh, having me and Scott on. And really to, to you guys and to all indie media who pushes uh, Medicare for All and all the orgs around who are constantly, you know, pushing petitions and legislation, everything like that. Um, this is a big movement and millions of people know we need Medicare for all. We need it. End of story. Um, so I, I think I wrote down, let me see. Oh, okay. So I did want to give like a, a brief explanation of a few of the things that the, the money that was raised go to. Um, so I don't know if you saw a video the other day I posted. Um, it looks like a computer. It's freaking huge. And it weighs like 100 pounds. It looks like a desktop. Um, but uh, it's like a projector underneath and where you can put a book and mail, things like that underneath. Um, and it magnifies it so you're looking at the screen. Um, so because of that, I was able to read some of a book for the first time in over a year. And as an English major, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I just read a paragraph. Like I was like, I was so ecstatic. So well, that's what was your uh, what was your weapon of choice? Where where mm, did you go? Good question. Well, what did you dive you into? Know, I, I Catherine the Rye. <laughs> good choice. I mean, hey, that that is never a bad choice. I was like, I want it to be something I love. Sure. And something that means something and something I treasure, and it's like a real old copy. And I was like, that's what it's got to be. <laughs> So yeah, I that's the kind of stuff that that your donations are are going towards. I also just got a tablet, which um, the the blind uh, capability um, uh, programs go along with this tablet. So I was able to buy that on Friday, um, and I was able to pay off three medical bills, um, and I just got a. <laughs> an EOP today that I'm really pissed off about. Uh, but I digress. So this is what your do donations are going to. The, this equipment, things like that, this is, it's changing my life. Like I'm not even overreacting. Like it changes my life. When you have been sighted your whole life and then you're in your 40s and all of a sudden you can't find an email that works. You can't find, you know, your back is hurting because you're constantly like this. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating, but it's also like, there's got to be something better, but you don't have the means, you know? So that's where so many of you guys came in. And again, I, I can't thank you enough. And also, I do want to say, like, this has meant so much to my family as well. Like, you know, my parents are 80. They they don't have any money, you know, and, and seeing their daughter go blind, it's, you know, yeah, I'm in my 40s, but that, you know, as parents, you don't, you know, they're still your kids. So this has been incredibly difficult on my parents and their reaction when I told them um, about the donations and they're just very thankful. Yeah. I, I, I know that um, you you're thankful for the donations and I'm really thankful that everyone contributed to this, but also I, I think I speak for Ron and everyone watching that we're really thankful to you joy because what you provide is a service you have done hundreds of shows, literally, and it is very clear that there's nobody more authentic, more genuine than you. You actually care about this. Like you, you haven't made money off of your shows. You do this because you actually care. And so when people are donating to you, they're thanking you 
for everything that you've done for the movement, your advocacy, speaking out on things that are controversial, speaking out when it's not necessarily convenient. So think of the the donations as a thank you to you, because I think that what you've done, like your your contribution to the movement, that can never be repaid. So honestly, like we all are thankful for the donations, but we're also thankful for you, Joy, because you are freaking awesome. And I think that everyone acknowledges that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, you know, you know, Joy, there's only so many of us lefty punk rocker streamers, so we really got to stick together. I need you. <laughs> I need you. Seriously. Really? I mean, come on. Who else has like blue hair and piercings <laughs> and tattoos? Like, I'm irreplaceable. <laughs> right. there's, there's no other podcast host that has as many tattoos as I do. So you have to have oh, that representation oh, in indie uh-uh. media. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No. <laughs> No, I have both arms, chest, back, legs. Oh, oh we're, we're going to fight. <laughs> you, both, you both have beautiful ink. You both have very Thank beautiful you, ink. Thank I, you. I, just have, I, I just have like one right on, on the side here. I only have one, so I'm, I'm, I'm I pretty. Uh, you have one? Yeah, I just have one. I'm, I'm pretty uneventful, but uh, but yeah. But y'all have beautiful ink. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think um, so now what we're going to do is play uh, the first couple clips from some of my favorite guests. Um, So just little like a little one minute, two minute montage of like, and I'm sure you guys have had these people on as well. Um, And these are just some some fun or poignant uh, moments that stuck out to me tweeted this today and it really resonated with me every human being has a deep seated desire to be creative and productive it's our responsibility to do everything possible to create a society in which they can so we were talking a a little before we went live about you know me you know, going blind and maybe not being able to do my show again after four years. Um, and you said some very kind things. What What is your response, you know, to, to other people who are out there who maybe not just are going disabled, but to, they get, they feel defeatist. They feel, should I keep being creative and, and playing music or painting or, or doing these things I love? Um, what do you say to them? What kind of um, hope can you give them? Well, first of all, I want to talk about you for a moment. And I invite all of your listeners and your viewers to refuse to enroll with you in the idea that you are going to quit your show. Okay, just stop it right now. Don't go there. (laughs) Uh, Your show is important. Your show is fun. There aren't that many people who can present this kind of progressive political vision and still be joyful and fun. You are loved and it is your spirit. And and also, as we were talking about before, you know this, Joy. First of all, we don't join with you in consciousness and the uh, the idea that it is inevitable that you will lose uh, your sight completely. Number one, we don't, because as Deepak Chopra says, believe the diagnosis, but not the prognosis, because it's not necessarily going to happen. Number two, even if it happens, that's not to say it will not be reversed. And number three, even if it happens, between technology and and your own spirit, you will find ways to compensate for that. There's nothing that you have done. Like I saw you just in the last few moments, right? In the last few minutes that I've been on this show with you, uh, you'll, you'll look very closely to read the tweets. But I know that you know that even if it were to happen that you couldn't read it anymore, there would be ways that you could still read it. I mean, no, you're going to do your show, okay? So let's not, I, I really, you don't need a lot of people agreeing with you that you might quit your show. So that, I hope that everybody will write into you now and say, <laughs> no, you're not quitting your show. Oh, that, that's number one. Uh, how much you have to give uh, physical, physicality is not what uh, uh, determines. That is why I love that woman. (laughs) Like that was the first time we ever talked. And I was like, 
she's the best. Like she is the best, even behind the scenes, so authentic. And Marianne will be joining us shortly. I'm so excited. Um, have you guys ever uh, interviewed Marianne? I have, have you not, heard? no. Yeah, I haven't either, but I, um, I've been a fan of Marianne. I've been a stan of Marianne, admittedly. <laughs> And I'll admit at first, I, I wasn't like when she was preaching this message of love and happiness, I it didn't resonate with me initially because I'm like, no, 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 I am not in a love and happiness kind of mood. I have tear it down, burn it all down energy. And I'm not feeling that. But with time, as she spoke more and more, uh, she won me over. And what her message is, is exactly what I think we need, like peace, love, happiness, kindness. Uh, because there's, I think there's a time and a place for like tear it all down, be angry, but also we can't just focus on on the negative. We have to try to embrace each other, and and just you know acknowledge the um, the mutual respect and love in this community. And even if the establishment and the system itself fails us, we do have each other, um, and, and that's really important. That that's meaningful. And so you know, as I heard more and more of her, and. Uh, just learned about how knowledgeable she is. Yeah, I became uh, Marianne Stan, and uh, she is now my queen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, queen. Well, yes, you know, it's queen. funny. I, I always say I only stand two things. Uh, I stand love, and I stand a general strike. And and I think in some ways that that's sort of a yin and a yang. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. love, and then it's like general strike. We're shutting it down. But um. For a general strike to be successful, you need a lot of love. And the love is not directed at the system. That's where the love is not directed. The love is directed at each other because mm -hmm. we're really going to need to have each other's back for something like that to work. So, uh, so yeah, it, it's, uh, it's connected more than it isn't, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Because, absolutely. I mean, let's think about it. Why are we out in the streets with a general strike? because we love humanity. We don't want to see them suffering. We want them to have roofs over their head and health care and food for their children. That That's what it all comes down to. That's, that's the beauty of progressives. N none of it is, I want to get mine. It's always for the greater good, always. Yeah, and, and can I just say that Marianne's message, it really resonated with me last year. Um, when I just felt so lost after the primaries, after COVID hit, after I lost my dad. I mean, I, I think I've talked to both of you about this, where when I went on Ron's show last year, I'm like, listen, I'm just living in Animal Crossing. That's my new life. That's my world. Uh, you know, Joy and I have joked about how, you know, I don't, I, what, do, what do we even do now? And so her <laughs> message was so good because she just, she gave you that words of encouragement that was lacking. Like, you know, you didn't want to, accept it you just accept you know what it's the apocalypse now we're just marching straight off that cliff so let's just enjoy. but you know she really the way that she says things it, it helped to kind of break through to me in a really dark time which is why i just have such a profound respect for her and also i have to admit that when she dunked on dave rubin that was hilarious so it's like you know how, how can you not love marianne <laughs> and called out k-hive i mean queen uh, queen Seriously. yes and ironically queen yes queen <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, Oz, do you want to do you want to play the next clip? Um, well, thank you so much for joining me again. I know people were pretty hype, especially the ladies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that seems to happen every time I mention you. The girls are like, what time? Uh, that was really unprofessional. I apologize. But uh, <laughs> thank That's you. Right. I, really, I really appreciate you having me on and I, I love your work. Keep at it. Thank you so much. You guys may recognize Mr. Nathan Robinson. Um, I had him back about a year ago um, and we had a great discussion about his book um, and socialism and just essentially everything going on um, in the world, which is a lot. 
So a myriad of, of uh, fun things. So tonight I wanted to ask him back because um, not only do I love his work, but he's going through an interesting uh, time right now <laughs> with his with his uh, his own work. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us again, Nathan. I appreciate it. Hey, it's it's so it's so good to be back with you. You're one of my favorite people to be interviewed by. So uh, no, it's it's good to good to hang out. Thank you so much. And looking dapper as always, I love the tie. Essentially, if you're voting for a candidate who does not want universal health care, whether you need it or not, is moot. If they don't want it, if they don't want uh, free college tuition and trade school, if they don't want a Green New Deal, if they don't want to get money out of politics, if they don't want lower prescriptions, you vote for someone who doesn't support these things are you not responsible for the deterioration of you know humanity that's that's already occurring it's amazing to me when especially when they say call him sexist right and you know when women online are saying this and i'm always like well women health care costs more money because you were born with the pre-existing condition of being female <laughs> so uh women it is should be that like the top of the list for feminist issues of like free health care and all of these these poor women and women working class women women of color women of all different ethnicities who don't have health care or don't have access to free or affordable health care and it costs they just charge women more money because they're women it's it's preposterous so for, for you to say you're against that it's like so you're then against the inequities of health coverage towards women <laughs> so you want you want it to right. still be uneven and more expensive i don't get it i don't get it Absolutely. as a doctor i know what my patient needs she knows what she needs to make herself feel better but just because her employer, I guess maybe it costs two, two, three, four, five dollars more than the other inhalers, they just flat out refuse to pay for it. So in a single payer Medicare for all system, we're gonna put the power back in the in your doctor's hands, which is putting the fur back in the people's hands. So we're gonna eliminate all that red tape. Absolutely. Some of my viewers know um Back in August of 18, I woke up one day legally blind, just overnight. Uh, myopic degeneration is what I was diagnosed with. So I have to get um, injections in my eyes every month. It's as bad as it sounds. Um, and each one is over $12,000. So two eyes, 12 months. And the insurance company was telling me they couldn't deem it medically necessary because it's rare and i'm only 40 years old so i was getting bills for like thirty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars and they weren't letting me get other ones until that was straightened out and i was like this is it's a nightmare it is an absolute nightmare it's traumatic it's your fault that you're the age that you are like things can't happen outside of the age of normal. It, it's just horrendous. Um, I've had people who have been stable mm -hmm. on medications for illnesses for a long, long time, including medicine for some really like slow, some, some cancers are kind of like really, really slow and we call them indolent. And they've been stable on those medicines for a long, long time. Then all of a sudden they either lose their job and they get another one with a different insurance. Or sometimes they keep the same job, but their employer just negotiates with a different insurance company because it's cheaper for them. And so then their medicine that they could have been on for five, 10, 10 years and been stable and, and living and healthy, all of a sudden the new insurance company would say, oh, we don't pay for that. But like, what do you mean you don't pay for it? This patient, this patient has been on this medicine for years. You you and him seem to have such a close relationship. It's so beautiful. The, the first time I saw you was on an interview in 2015 when you were talking about how proud your parents would be of him um, for running for the president. And you got so emotional. And it was it was one of the things that convinced me to, to campaign for him. Um, so what was what was your thought the first time, you know, Bernard said to you, hey, I'm going to run for president? <laughs> <laughs> well, you I, yeah, I can't really remember exactly, but I mean, he did talk about it for at least a year before he announced it. So I, 
It wasn't the surprise. Uh, and I, I thought once he said it the year before, he said, you're going to go around and talk to everybody and figure it out because it's a big thing. And the big thing to him wasn't that he would get beaten badly or anything. He said he's used to that. He'd been through that. He could cope with that. But what he feared was that if he tried to run and did very badly, the political wisdom would become, ah, you can't do that. And the people who need the policies that Bernard is talking about would be the ones to suffer. So that's what he was really concerned about for that year. Uh, and it was when he, he made up his mind that it wouldn't be a, a, a washout uh, that he, he decided to go. But, and, and I suppose I, I, I saw it coming and he was, it was very nice when he, he came out of the Senate, you may remember, to make his first announcement. There were about a dozen uh, yeah. min minor <laughs> journalists there. And I, another dozen people happened to be walking past, <laughs> and he came out and, and he said, "I got a few minutes. I'm work. I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> I want to tell you, I'm going to run for president." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but what, what was very nice for me in particular, there was a, a British journalist there, and he and he said, "Oh, I see your brother's running for Poland. What do you do? You have something to say about that?" Brother said, "Oh well." Yes, he's very good. <laughs> they should elect him. <laughs> it was a big help to me growing up. Uh, so that was very nice. Today, I am joined by one of my... Oh, my God. Uncle Larry. I love that man so much. One of my favorite interviews. I mean, oh, my God, I love that man. He is such a... A darling person, just so kind. Um, what do you guys think of that? Well, I, I actually, uh, I'm on my phone for this thing, so I, I don't know if it's the same case for everyone, but I actually can't see the videos. I can just hear them. So, so that one was a very obvious. I was like, oh, that's uh, Bernie Sanders' brother. That's who that is. That's for sure <laughs> yeah, who that the is. The real Bernie bro. <laughs> <laughs> and he's um. He's in the Green Party over in England, isn't he? He is 84, and he serves in the UK Green Party for healthcare specifically. He is the the leader of their healthcare. Um, so yeah, it was it was great to have them on, um, so we could talk about the the differences, you know, um, sure. what they have, what we should have and don't have, and um, is Mike like. Where, where's my my drop? I wonder, I wonder if dropped Mike off. Had a tech hiccup or something. He yeah, maybe he had like a connection dropped or something. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I've got ours fixed, I think, but uh, I'm gonna check into it tomorrow. So I'll put Mike back in as soon as he comes. I well, I know I know you and you and I have 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 joked about what their what their like brotherly conversations are like, where he's like, "Hey, Bernie, you still you still trying to get healthcare? Shut the fuck up, Larry." Shut up. <laughs> How did... <laughs> Boris Johnson's no walk in the park, Larry. Well, you still got the shitty duopoly, Bernie. Shut up, Larry. <laughs> yeah, it would definitely be, um, you know, Bernard. Hey, Bernard. And then Bernie would be like, what? What? Speak up. Bernard, <laughs> the Tories are to the left of the Democratic Party. What are you doing over there? What are you doing over there? <laughs> you realize in England... Compared to everyone, we're considered the right out of all the countries there. I would say the EU, but we're not in the EU anymore because of Brexit. That's a whole different story. But for crying out loud, we're considered the right wing. And we're a utopia compared to you guys. What are you doing? <laughs> I know, Larry. Shut up. <laughs> and then you put Larry's son, Levy, in the mix. Every time I talk to Levy on the phone, I swear it's Bernie. He just curses a lot. That's the only difference. He'll be like, hi, George. How you doing? And I'm just like, I expect him to be talking like, hi, George. <laughs> oh, my God. I, yeah, I wish yeah, Bernie would have cursed more, actually, to tell you the truth. I, I wish Bernie would have cursed more. Like, I wish Bernie, you know what, Joe? You're full of shit. I wish we would have gotten more. We needed that. <laughs> yes. Yes, please, Bernie. Um. The one thing, you know, that really surprised me about Uncle Larry was on the show, um, 
we were talking about, you know, just things. And then all of a sudden he started getting very emotional and he started sharing the story about how their relatives were killed in the Holocaust. And he got very emotional. Um, and it was so touching because a lot of people don't realize like the anti-Semitism that, that he deals, that Bernard deals with he get a lot um, especially mm. during the presidential campaign. So um, to have Larry, you know, open up and, and share their experience with that and things like that, it was it was powerful. It was very emotional. There Mark's back. Yeah. Sorry, I literally just hey, lost internet. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't want to get on a pedestal right now, but this is why we need municipal broadband. They're working yes. on you. Well, no, on- no, <laughs> seriously. Let let's I know Ron Ron you're the the expert of that so let's let's touch on that for a minute. I don't know about expert, but you know it's an issue that I that I care a lot about that I'm really into. So I so I kind of geek out about it on my show and and Mike also he we're we're fellow uh, net neutrality in in uh, Muni broadband Indeed. enthusiasts. We 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 have geeked out about it on each other's shows uh, many a times. Uh, and it is important. I, I mean, I really feel like, um, you know, a summary that they um, or an analogy they made in Ars Teca, Technica recently that I thought was a really good one. They're like, this is almost our modern day electricity battle. You know, like, like there was a point in time where electricity, only the elites had it. Uh, and obviously that's not the case with Internet, like Internet's a little more extensive than that. But, you know, they got to a point where they realized this is a utility in people's lives. And they pretty much made it a public utility. Not completely, shockingly enough. There's still issues with electricity in various parts of the United States, which is appalling and shocking. But it, it's come a very, very long way. And uh, they're hoping that, uh, you know, it's time for the Internet to do a similar thing where it becomes a utility in our lives. And municipal broadband accomplishes that because it takes the Internet out of big cables hands and into the hands of cities and municipalities. And by the way, places in the United States that already have this, they get better Internet at a better price. So, so all these people who say, well, is it really, if we, if we take it out of, if we put it in the hands of government, will it really be better? And, and, I, and you know, to those people, I always say, I, I know that AT&T and Comcast, they're really knocking it out of the park. So it's hard <laughs> to imagine anything better. But so far, uh, the, the statistics are 100% to 0% that municipal broadband is better. Literally, I'll repeat it for, for the folks, uh, for the folks in, in the peanut seats, 100% to 0%. So, uh, so yeah, that's what municipal broadband is. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on the wonderful Comcast, and I just lost internet during a live stream, and this happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm stuck with them too. And you know, when I went to um, Occupy DNC to to protest at the first convention, um, to you know, uh, for Bernie, when <laughs> when I arrived at the train station. Comcast welcomes you to DNC, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, oh, my God, no. <laughs> but I don't have any other choice. You know, they they monopolize it. Mm-hmm. You don't have a choice. In, in in a lot of areas, you have the choice between either Comcast or some dial-up option. You know, some weird, depending on where you're at. If you're in a rural area, like dial-up is your only option in some yeah. states, like believe it or not, or in areas of states, or you have Verizon. Uh, it, like you have one or two options and they're both terrible usually. So anyone who's against municipal broadband at this point, I, I just have to think that they haven't had Comcast or AT&T or something like, but everyone has. So there's no reason to be against it. If we own it, then it's ours. We control it. You know, this is, this is, one of the most important things that I've been I've been advocating for for a while because, it, like the internet nowadays in, in 2021, you can't get a job without an without an internet connection. You can't um, really engage politically or inform yourself about things. Uh, follow news, you know, get access go to, to yeah, go to school yeah. without an internet connection, especially during COVID. That's exactly right. You, um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it's abundantly clear. It's clearly a utility in our lives. And, and, and the thing about this, too, like, like you're saying, like, like everyone is for this. I mean, there was a, a, a short documentary that came out recently called uh, I, I believe it's called Do Not Pass Go. And I've actually watched it. And it's about this small town in North Carolina um, where they were fighting for municipal broadband. They wanted their own network. And, and you hear 
um, you know, the, these people in this small town in North Carolina, I, I don't want to assume, but I'm going to take a guess that at least some of them are definitely not big lefties or anything like that. But they're saying the same things I say. This is a utility. This is about the digital divide. This is this isn't right. And and so, you know, it's not a left right issue. It's a have have not issue. And, and you know, there, there's um, across the political spectrum, no pun intended, there is uh, their support for municipal broadband. Absolutely. I saw um, uh, last month, I saw a really powerful picture of two young girls who couldn't have been more than, I don't know, maybe eight, sitting on the ground in a Burger King parking lot trying to get a signal on their laptops so they could do schoolwork. Yeah. So what if it rains what if first of all why are they by themselves but then what are you going to do the parents got to go to work they have to go to school so you know these kids have been going to homeschool for a year how many other kids you know have to go sit in restaurants or what have you to just be able to do school work yeah well well, and and kind of near you in, in philadelphia they were pleading with comcast to put these hotspots up in various parts of the city that were underserved so the kids could go to these hotspots to learn. And gee, do we really want this for-profit company that is considered among the more despicable companies in the world? And it's not just Comcast. I mean, AT&T is, is no better, but um, you know, do we really want them to, uh, to be the, uh, to be the gatekeeper on whether or not our children get to learn that's a uh, dystopian and disturbing. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Um, Oz, do you want to bring in the, the next video? Congressman Ro Khanna. Um, he is a California uh, member of the House and also Bernie 2020's co-chair. Um, so thank you so much for coming back to join us, Ro. Thank you so much for having me back on. I always love doing the show. Awesome. Yeah, this is our fourth time, but this is the first time since Bernie 2020. Um, so that's so exciting. I was so excited when I found out you were on the team. Um, what What's going on with the campaign right now? Can you just give the, the listeners a, a heads up of, you know, all the awesome things we have going on? Sure. Well, it's been an incredible honor to be a co-chair for Senator Sanders' campaign. Um, do you have any any words you want our viewers to take away? Just, we got to keep pressing on. I mean, like I said earlier, I think I said, you know, pretty much everything I wanted to say on that front. It's That's just, Justin uh, Jackson. You got to keep fighting, you know? And I think I have a, you know, very, you know, obviously personal um story just like your just like your own and i want to make sure that that you know doesn't happen to any more people and that's why i'm such a huge fighter on that front um you know i think it's we need to catch up <laughs> we need to catch up to the world everyone knows that um but it's not going to happen by just you know, sitting on our ass and and talking about it we actually got to go out there and do it we got to go out there and make sure we're fighting for it um and you know, when you start, you know, putting your body into these fights, um, you know, using your voice and actually, like I said earlier, disrupting capital and, and disrupting the convenience that we live that we live in this country with, like that's when you start getting people to notice. Um, and if you have a just fight that you're fighting, um, you know, hopefully, you know, if we can get enough people behind us, um, you know, we, like I said, we can we can bend it towards our way um and we need it it's something that we need we we it's not something that we can just hope for and want and maybe in 20 years you know maybe in five years we'll have you know medic medicare down to 55 maybe then 50 like we need this now and there's people every single day that are that are going without health care that are living with that stress and anxiety and, and don't want to lose their job and all these things we cannot afford that in this country anymore. we can't and so, like I said earlier, Joy, I'm in this fight with you, um, and I'm hoping that everyone can join us so we can just keep pressing on. Um, if, if there's ever anything I can do to help, let me know. Um, I've got a lot of time on my hands now, so 
um, let me know and, and I'm there and I'm there. And uh, I appreciate you having me on too. Um, and, you know, your story was so powerful. Um, and I, you know, always wanted to come on the show. So I'm very appreciative uh, you reaching out to me and I'm glad that we could get this done. Absolutely. It is an honor and I'm so excited. This was something your guest, I was like, somebody get him on my show for like three months. You. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god justin jackson is just he's a gem he is an absolute gem ron you've had him mike have you ever had him i haven't had him i'd love to have him i okay he's i don't know best. anything about sports or football uh but i think it just the fact that he's so engaged and so involved in politics to me when he doesn't have to be is awesome. Like massive, massive respect that he cares so much about these things. Um, I, so my first exposure to him was on, I think Kyle and Corin's show when they were talking about Justin Jackson, a football player, NFL player. I'm like, Oh, I don't know who that is, but that's awesome. Like anyone who doesn't have to care, but they do care is so like the mad respect. He's yeah. I, I, I'm a, I'm a chargers fan now because of him. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm more of a hockey guy than a football guy in general. Uh, like, I, like, I don't really follow football that much. And uh, usually when I do, I'm watching college. But, um, but yeah, I'm a Chargers fan now because of him. I mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh. So, you know, it was always – I grew up with the Steelers. But, um, you know, their quarterback is not the greatest guy in the world. And he yeah. gives money to organizations like Blue Lives Matter. So Oof. I just can't yep. – you know, like, like I, I don't have some – I don't have some unreasonable like like expectations from professional athletes or whatever, but but it, it got to the point where I was just like, I, I can't root for this team anymore. I, I Are you talking about can't. Tom Brady? I'm talking about Ben Roethlisberger. Oh, okay. I should have yeah, I should have known is, I wouldn't be able to get he it. He is worse than Tom Brady. <laughs> he is worse than Tom Brady, and, and he is. I think he is done. I, I think he is. He is not good anymore. He he got humiliated in the playoffs this year. And but for some reason, he is like to like diehard Pittsburgh sports fan. He is like their Hillary Clinton. He can oh, do no. no wrong. He could execute a baby in the middle of Fifth Avenue. And then they would be like, well, the baby was talking shit and made the babies from Cleveland or something. That's what they would do. I, I mean, he could oh. he could break his arm. They'd still want him to start at quarterback. It, it, it's absolutely um, uh, insane. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm like, I'm, I, I can't root for this team anymore. I just can't do it. The Roethlisberger worship is uh, just unjustified on every level. And, um, you know, and yeah, so I'm, I'm a Chargers fan now. Go Chargers, baby. I am too, I'm because still, that's I'm the only team I know. Fan. I'm still a Pittsburgh Penguins fan, but Steelers, we're done. Go Chargers. I'm, I'm pro Chargers too, because that is the one football team I can name. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So it was go, my go middle Chargers. school's football team. So okay, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I won't say anymore because I'm going to embarrass myself with my knowledge of sports or sports or lack thereof. I should say. <laughs> well, you know it's oh, funny. Yeah. My manager, uh, my manager, when he saw that uh, Justin did my podcast, he, he thought that was just really cool, and he's just like, "Oh, so how do you know Justin Jackson? Were you guys college buddies?" And, and Justin's an NFL player. So he's like, what, like 25, 26 years old? He's Maybe 24, even your, yeah. He's 24. Mm. So anyway, I just, my, my manager asked me that. He's like, were you guys college buddies? And I just go, yes, we were. Yes, <laughs> that's, that is exactly how we know each other. <laughs> we were we in actually, college together. We were actually just almost drafted. School a year ago. I'm 25. <laughs> You should have been like, well, I was almost drafted to the NFL with him, but there was one spot available. And I'm like, no, let Justin go. <laughs> I gave <laughs> up that Justin spot. Let Justin take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, where is that? Oz, do you want to play the last uh, video? Hey, what's up, guys? This is the Vanguard. I'm Zach. And I'm Gavin. Uh, if you're here watching this, obviously you're taking part in watching Joy's live stream to fundraise some new equipment for her show. Um, obviously, she's one of the only disabled streamers that's really in this movement or part of this lefty progressive media space. And we really value her commentary and work here at the Vanguard. Uh, so, you know, make sure to support her if possible, comrades. Yeah, definitely. You know, obviously we're partial to Joy because she's a great friend of the show. We love having her on. 
we, but yeah, we think she's a tremendous uh, voice in this media space. Obviously, as you mentioned, there is a real lack of, of representation uh, in the in the bread tube space, right? Let's call it what it is. And uh, you know, Joy uh, is such a, a bright uh, light in that. Uh, you know, kind of uh, op occupying that space that's uh, like uh, like we said, really uh, not as diverse as it needs to be. And uh, and you know, one of the things that goes along with making sure that spaces are inclusive and diverse is making sure that people have the resources necessary to participate. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is why here at the Vanguard, we strongly encourage anybody who has the financial means to to just chip in a couple bucks. Uh, if you have it, you know, really will go a long way. Um, and if you can't, just make sure that you spread the word and are making sure that uh, you're helping out that way. But yeah, cheers, everybody. Thanks for uh, checking this out. That was awesome. Uh, those are my boys. I got you guys hooked up too. Both of you guys went on the, the Vanguard. Yes. I had a blast on their show. Yeah, I, I had so much fun on their show. And, 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 and you know, I, I don't want to... It's always cool to me when it's like, and I know like both of you are, are, but it's always cool to me when it's not another person in New York or LA, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, like, and, and I know that's weird because I mean, I, I do live in LA, but, but it, it's cool to me when it's like, they're doing their thing and they're in like, like Kansas or something like that. Yeah. Somewhere like that. I just dig it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, I dig their show. I, I dig their vibe and uh, I had so much fun on their show and, and I, 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 I haven't had them on mine yet. I have to do that. And I, and I can't wait to go back on there. So they're a lot of fun. Yeah. Shout out to Zach and Gavin. They are so entertaining. Um, when I was on their show, it was so much fun. And I saw the last clip that I watched, uh, I've got to get caught up, but they they did an interview with, or they did a video where they reacted to um, a clip from Kyle and Crystal's show interviewing Andrew Yang. And they were just going off on like BDS and they were so fired up and so knowledgeable. Like I sent them. them that clip and I'm like, oh, look they, at this. they got me fired. Like I was watching it and they got me fired. I'm like, this is this is damn good com like they're this is phenomenal commentary like they're they're so they're awesome i love them yeah they're you know ron and and uh ron and the vanguard boys both said you know when i started my site has gotten you know worse and worse and now um it's 85 percent gone um and it is progressive just like me um so i <laughs> I, that's, I like that that's cute <laughs> <laughs> so i i asked ron and vanguard boys if we could do a monthly show so we've been doing that for a few months um ron and i do the last tuesday of every month and it's called that time of the month and mm -hmm. then <laughs> vanguard we do the first monday of every month and i think we're doing like vanguardian joy or something weird um <laughs> i'm not sure um, i like how they have this like uh it, it almost sounds like royalty like like this very like like royalty s title then you and i just have that time of the month huh? <laughs> yeah. i have a dog see what we did <laughs> yeah. and then we spend at least like five to ten minutes talking about getting you high and then just music and then it's like all right now news but really we're gonna get joy high someday yeah because i have for those watching who haven't seen shows with ron and myself i have never done pot done pot you gotta do it live right. on stream you know so it, you watch. she describes it as doing pot that's how you know she's <laughs> never done it so so because of that, and my friends always tease me, they always have, I, you know, and I've just been like, I just don't like the smell. I, you know, whatever I'm pro legalization. I just, I've never done it. And, uh, apparently, you know, my sister-in-law is going to be flying my husband and I out to California, um, coming up when it gets better. And, I said to Ron, I said, hey, you can be my first, uh, you know, uh, smoke or take pot with, have pot with. <laughs> He's going to do um, Rice Krispie Treats. Maybe. I mean, I'm worried because those turned out really freaking powerful. 
Um, oh no! But I'm I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to a dispensary and I'm gonna get like good. This is your first time, and like mm-hmm. I'll give you a, a little bit and see how you you handle it. Um, but uh, but know. yeah, don't worry. You're a good hands. You're a good hands. But trust me, you're I, gonna have a fun time. He is going to be signing a waiver, whether he allows me or not. I'm getting a waiver. <laughs> I will have it notarized. You will not film me. <laughs> yeah, you said I couldn't live stream the whole thing, but then no. but you said I, I can't record it. And I was like, we- what if I'm not recording? I'm live streaming. That's not, this is not being recorded. I mean, it'll live on the internet, but I'm streaming. <laughs> There's a difference. We have to at least have oh a picture God. of high joy. I kind of feel like the world needs that to see you high well, and giggling. I am anyway. Like, I don't know <laughs> if it's going to be that different. Like, nobody believes me when I say I haven't ever done it. They're like, it's, it's going to be you. different. <laughs> You, you could be like me. My first time I did it, I like barely inhale, like barely inhale, like I did a little teeny okay, tiny bit. And then I'm like, oh my God, am I high? I wasn't high, but um, <laughs> it was still fun. <laughs> Your first time is always a, a story, you know? Oh my God. It will be one for the grandkids. That's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how Marianne feels on the topic. So this is kind of like a really weird intro. Um, but, uh, we would love to welcome Miss Marianne Williamson in, um, the reason I wanted, there she is, the reason I wanted her to join us so much tonight is because as you guys saw in the clip, um, earlier, her kindness has just been overwhelming. Um, you have inspired me more than you can fathom. Um, even behind the scenes, you know, we, we meet a lot of people that behind the scenes, they're not the same as when you say, okay, we're on the air. Um, and your kindness has just, it's, it's warmed my heart. I I can't even put it into words. Um, you inspire me. Um, and, and Mike apparently as well, who stands you. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me again, especially so soon after I just had you. Well, it's been fun listening to everybody. It's been a lot of fun and it's been very interesting. I do. I want to go back if I might a little, I want to talk about the money if I may, uh, because you said that it was a fundraiser and then you said that this is thank you, but I think I probably have questions that other people have too. Because when you were first talking with Katie Halper and Bree, you talked about tremendous expenses. So did your insurance ultimately cover all that? Um, no, I actually went through a um, at the hospital because I was ringing up so many thousands. Um, they gave me charity care. Oh, okay. And yeah. then the money that you were raising for the equipment, have you gotten all the equipment? I have not. Some of it is pre- um, uh, prescription. You need prescription. So I'm going to see the specialist on Tuesday. Because um, been- and then she has to actually physically write prescriptions and order them directly from um, the places who are specifically uh, for uh, people with low vision. Because I was sitting there the whole time watching you going, where's the donate button? Where's the donate button? Oh, uh, <laughs> so um, Oz, I think Oz, did you put it in the comments? Yeah, Amber, Amber did, and I'm also going to okay. reformat the rundowns so, so it's easy. And I think it's part. on the last slide. Right, well. yeah, and it's, it's right above your heads right now. So. Okay, oh. good. Because, you know, all this talk about love and appreciating you and all being here together, I think people want to help you right now as you go through this and uh, give us the chance to do that. And so if there's anybody who's listening... Uh, and hasn't gotten that point. I hope that you will get that point that we're uh, helping Joy to buy all this equipment so that she can, like when you were talking about reading, you say catch on the rye. Uh, this is an English major who's having a hard time reading. We can't let that stand. And all the various things she was talking about. So quite seriously. And I think, you know, it's kind of like political donating. Sometimes people think, well, you know, all I can give is $5 or $10. But these things add up. So, Joy, give us a chance to be there for you, seriously. 
I mean, the word is out, you know, and I think that like Ron and, and, and Mike have made very clear tonight, you know, we want you on the air. We want you doing your thing. But uh, give us the chance to be there for you the way you're there for everybody else. Thank you so much. What, um, I, and this is a question to all three of you. What, well, first, I guess I will ask Marianne. I, I'm always surprised when someone of, um, I don't know how to say, like of your stature or what have you, but someone who's so like well known and, and everything is cool with doing independent media. So that it always surprises me the way that you were so willing to come on my show. Um, so as as you know, someone who does go on a lot of independent media, what it what do you feel the importance of it is versus you know your MSNBC things like that? <laughs> well, I think we all we all know the answer to that, and you know it's a, <laughs> it's actually not a funny topic. It's a very serious topic. We know you're sitting here talking about AT and T and Comcast. You know the conglomeratization of the corporate conglomeratization of the mainstream news, including cable stations is no different you know it's a monopoly not only a monopoly of the of the of the airwaves it's a monopoly on ideas um we all know this and the fact that i you know my experience running for president um the the value of being in the belly of that beast the political media industrial complex um so independent media is where the truth gets told you know where you have some real conversations. And Ron, I know of your work, but I'm not as, as familiar with you as I am with you, Mike, but I'm certainly familiar with you, Mike, and I and I value so highly. This is where the more serious conversations happen. Um, we're, uh, you know, for all the fun that we're having here tonight and all the jokes and all of that, there was the serious side of, you know, the conversation about your situation, but also the serious politics that everybody here is dedicated to. Um, I... I wish that I'd known more of you guys earlier on. You know, I, I'm from your ideational corner, but I wasn't from your tribal corner, culturally, partly because I'm older, partly because I'm, you know, than you are, and, and partly because I just kind of came in the door, I came into the room from another door. I didn't know you and you didn't know me. Um, and I, I, you know, I was, I was clearly seen for who I am uh, by certain establishment elites, which is why they worked so hard to make sure people thought I was not who I am. And uh, I feel that it's only on independent media where I find people who are having the same conversation I'm having. Absolutely. Mike, as, as someone who's a streamer, you've been doing it. Um, I've done it four years. You've doing, you've been five, right? Yeah. I'm coming up on six years this June which wow. is crazy. So yeah. what, what does it mean to you to be able to be independent media and share, you know, your own thoughts uh, versus, you know, and encourage people to tune into you rather than, you know, go that other bad route? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's liberating uh, because we live in a really, there's a lot of problems, but there's also a lot of really great things that I think uh, we take for granted, myself included. And one is the internet. Um, for me, I was on a very straight path. I really, like, I never thought of myself as being like a political commentator or anything of that nature. Like I was the nerd who would like do data sheets and spreadsheets for my professors. And I wanted to be a teacher. The only reason why I started a YouTube channel was because I wanted some public speaking experience because I really wanted to teach. And then it, it kind of just took off. And um, I thought, if, if this takes off that fast, there's got to be like some demand that I'm meeting. And I think that it's just folks want someone who is going to present them information, not through the corporate filter, you know, because the, the issue with the news channels today, Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, is that they're not necessarily news channels, they're businesses, right? And so they, they have to say certain things, they have to censor themselves from saying certain things, because it's bad for business. I mean, if you talk about Medicare for all too much, private health insurers, big pharma, they're not going to want to necessarily advertise. Whereas with me, I'm just a normal person and I have bad takes. But if I have a bad take, it's not because I'm worried and I'm really self-censoring. I'm trying to hide what I, what I feel because I'm trying to att attract donors. Uh, you know, sometimes I just, um, I have to learn 
And I process the information. I try to give people the facts, try to dispel like all of the weird myths that you see in the narratives in corporate media and just present it to people as I see it, as truthful as possible. And necessarily like sharing news to me, it's never about like, hey, this is my opinion. Um, now you just take it as you will and regurgitate what I said. No, 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 I'm one person. I'm giving you an opinion and I want you to use my opinion to formulate your own views on politics. Use me as a jumping off point. You know, you can you can learn from folks like myself and and Marianne and Joy and Ron, but ultimately we're trying to help you formulate your own opinion and let you see that on mainstream media, there's there's a clear difference between a business and just a random person who's on the internet. You know, we're, we're normal people and, and as you get bigger platforms and get notoriety, you know, I think that it's it's still to me. I don't feel like um, it, it's a little bit weird to have a gigantic platform, but I feel like you know I have a responsibility to really make sure that people are staying engaged, but also trying to like channel my inner Marianne in my own way, my own nerdy way, and like you know acknowledge that the things that we talk about are so depressing you know when i when i talk about bad story after bad story like it's not just like i'm a robot and i'm reciting just facts of the day like it's weighing on me personally so you know i i try to you know um change it and, and rather than just talking all about news maybe afterwards we go on twitch and we play video games and we just joke and i bring on my dogs and my cat you know it's it's a process but you know to me i, I think that in terms of just overall the importance of indie media there has to be some counter some uh accountability mechanism for mainstream media, you know, some competition. And we do, uh, I, I think we meet that need in, in a number of ways. Well, that's why it was so important when you guys were talking about net neutrality and, and you know, all these people who are being deplatformed now. This is very serious what's going on. And that voices be out there that, that represent independent thought, not just independent media, independent thought serious stuff absolutely ron you and i did a um a full day uh i don't know what you'd want to call it a full day of um speakers uh for net neutrality oh yeah um, yeah yeah uh well mike i think mike helped did a spot oh, on yeah, that mike, too, you I'm, did I'm pretty too. Sure. yeah i mean uh and that's you know kind of going into all the stuff that we were talking about i, I mean it's um you know, it's been really cool for me, that, you know, to, to kind of see the community that gets built around all this, especially since, you know, I, I mean, I come from the world of comedy. I mean, I'm a comedian first, but, you know, it's been really cool that that, that platforms exist to be able to talk about stuff I really care about, you know, and, and have that comedic lens. And, and you know, I, I get to make like minded people feel a little bit better. And and that that that's a really that means a lot to me. Like, I love being able to do that. And, and if that, you know, I, I feel like that's just kind of great. And then also some of the topics I'm really interested in. I mean, yeah, I've gotten to collaborate. Um, there's an organization called Fight for the Future. They're one of many great digital rights organizations out there. Um, and they uh, we collaborated on a, um, a day of action for net neutrality together. And that was uh, what you're referring to, Joy. And and we went to the um, we went to the mm. Senate building in Washington D.C. We live streamed the whole thing. Uh, I was the only person who wore a T-shirt. Everybody else was dressed up, but I wore a T-shirt that said "Keep the Internet Weird" because I was <laughs> like, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't uh, hold reverence to this system. But anyway, uh, but yeah, we were Respect. going through the building. That's right. We went through the building. And uh, we presented a, um, I believe it was 50,000 signatures, uh, or it might have been more than that, actually. And if, I think it was more, but I, I forget the exact numbers, so don't quote me. But um, we presented all these signatures demanding that uh, they reinstate net neutrality. We presented it to Mitch McConnell's office. Uh, Mitch McConnell was not there. He stayed in his shell. But we were there, and we presented them to his office. Um, and, um, and yeah, we had, a, we knew nothing was going to come of it. I mean, this was during, uh, you know, the Trump administration and, and we knew it probably wasn't going to get anywhere, but we wanted to just keep the issue, um, alive and well and in the public spotlight. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's been amazing to, you know, meet all kinds of different people, like, like, like in the, in the comedy space and elsewhere, um, you know, to collaborate on things and, uh, you know, to, to touch briefly on the, the corporate media thing we were all talking about. I mean, I think that 
I used to say the media structure in the United States is toxic. Now I go a step further and I say, we don't have a media structure in the United States and that's toxic. And we really don't. There's some great journalism that happens in the United States. That's despite the system, not because of it. We don't have the notion of journalism as a public good. We have companies like, like Comcast, AT&T, and, and you know, Rupert Murdoch's wet dream. They are in news and information. They have no business being in news and information. Our media structure would be illegal in a lot of other countries. Our media structure would be illegal in Norway. It would last not a day because they actually have like a news and information bureau and there are elected people that are part of it. And, and so our news structure would literally be illegal there. So, um, so I think independent media in a place like the United States, it, it is absolutely essential, like, like well, beyond essential. When I was growing up, articles that would get people a Pulitzer Prize would get people fired today because 30 years ago, somebody's coming in and they say, we want to write an article about all the toxic chemicals that are being spewed from the factory down river. But today there's a very good chance that the same company owns the factory, owns the newspaper. Um, Matt Taibbi writes quite a bit about this in Hate Inc. And when I was growing up, you know, um, and this was all before Bill Clinton in the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the same company couldn't own the television station and the radio station and the newspaper. As a matter of fact, uh, my father used to talk to us about the fact that the, elef the elevator doesn't even stop at the same floor. The people who are in marketing can't even go to the floor as the people who are in journalism. And now, of course, as Ron said, it's all, it's all sales. It's not journalism anymore. It's business. And um, that, of course, is, is what has happened to this country. The bottom line, everything has been financialized. Everything has be become about a financial bottom line rather than really the things that matter most. And if a real free press doesn't matter most, where are we? We talk about how, you know, what, you know, uh, Donald Trump is, has done, calling it, you know, the enemy of the people. But what about what Bill Clinton did with the Telecommunications Act, making it just owned by a few companies? That's just as dangerous. It's just as dangerous. Absolutely. Well, in, in addition to that, Marianne, you, you have done some, some of your own shows as well. And you recently had um, a show where you talked about candidates that you were endorsing. Yeah. Yeah. I hope all of you will check that out. Maybe, uh, wow, that would be great. Maybe you guys will decide to have some of those candidates. If you go uh, to a candidate summit.com, uh, I just endorsed three more. They're the kind of progressive candidates talking about the things that all of us talk about. Uh, all of them are people, of course, that need the need the support. And right now, of course, is when people are starting to build these primary campaigns. I'd love it if you guys uh, would check that out and maybe have some of these people on. Jessica Mason in uh, Dallas and Christine Olivo in Florida. And some of these candidates are just fantastic. I, I hope I, that would be really exciting if you did that. Absolutely. I've had Jason call um, uh -huh. Up in Washington I, State. Yeah. 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 I he's getting he's got a name out there. Pardon? I screenshotted the. Uh -huh. So I'm going to go through and like message. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> he's fabulous. He's wonderful. There are a lot of people. Um, Shervin Azami out in California, Derek Marshall in California. Um, Eric Smith is running for North Carolina Senate. Of course, everybody knows who Lee Carter is running for uh, governor in Virginia. Yes. I but some me. of these candidates, Muad um, Harazi, Harazi, who's running in, in Connecticut, um, Michaela Wilkes running again in Maryland. There's some really great, great people. And of mm -hmm. course, they need all the all the visibility we can give them. And I think, you know, there's a lot. I think we'd all agree uh, our, our gang is very good about complaining. Um, but there does seem to me to be a gap uh, uh, in our support for the candidates who would actually change these things. You know, we complain about these, these terrible policies, but maybe we don't do as much as we could do to actually elect people who would re repeal the bad ones and replace them with new ones. You know, the left is really good about showing up for the hot and sexy presidential campaigns. We know that. But, you know, the right tends to be far more psychologically sophisticated and politically sophisticated, too, uh, showing up for those midterms. And the right will be, man, will they be on it next year. So I think that that's something we could all talk about a little bit more, actually, as candidates, uh, particularly progressive candidates, uh, 
because because what the DNC does, you know, everybody talks about the DNC and the establishment, Democrats, all of that that we know. And I certainly know what they do on the presidential level. We all do. But they do it on the congressional level also. You know, the, the, right. the real progressive candidates, they don't have the money to, to build these campaigns the way, you know, the DNC, the Chuck Schumers of the world say, can you self-fund? So who are the, who are the kind of people that have a million dollars of their own money that they can drop into a campaign. So then we wonder why there aren't policies for working class people. There aren't policies for working class people because there aren't enough working class people making the policies. Right. They're not going to get there unless we unless we work on getting them there. And we need to get started right now. Yeah, that's Absolutely. beautifully put. I wanted to add to that because you know, these other candidates who are funded by large multinational corporations and billionaires, they have a media apparatus. They have Fox News. Republicans have Fox News. You know, Democrats have uh, MSNBC. But we are the media apparatus for these, you know, grassroots candidates. And we're not as powerful, but we can at least help them to get their foot in the door and, and make up a little bit of the gap between them and the behemoth that they're facing. Um, well, so I love you that know. you said that. Yeah, and also, I, I, when you say we're not as powerful, I don't know. You know, remember, when you actually look at the, uh, where the American people are in the polls, what the people on this program represent in terms of, the, of, of policies are what the majority of Americans want, including Medicare for all. So I don't think we should think of ourselves, just like when I said to Joy, let's not think of yourself as, you know, even, you know, let's not identify with that which is, not our power, let's identify with that which is. And I think when, I think maybe there are a lot of people who don't know you exist, but that's the only reason you're not more powerful. And when you put how many viewers and all of these together, um, I think there's more power here than, and there's a, there's a power of buzz and there's the power of charisma and there's the power of, 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 of young people who think of yourself the way I think of all of you is there are people who might not know you exist yet, but they were already your fans. They just don't know you yet. And uh, so I, I think that um, I, I, I think you should own your power because the power of truth is greater than the power of, of the money that a few multinational corporations that are working to kill us all are representing. I love that. Yeah, I love that because it, it takes a change of mindset. And that's, yeah, yeah that's beautiful, Marianne. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think this is the the perfect way to go into our final thoughts and go into, um, you know, why, uh, why we're all here, but also for Marianne, I, you know, I encourage the, the disabled community to, to tune in because you've inspired me so much by, um, you know, uh, encouraging me. Um, so I, I hope other people can take that as well. Um, so for the disabled people who are watching or, or just, you know, mentally hurting, depressed, anxiety, anything like that, anyone who is feeling down, what can we all leave them with? Who wants to start? I'll start with something. Derek Chauvin was found guilty today. We're all so inundated with sad, bad news. We're all so overwhelmed by what's not working in America. We're all so assaulted daily by evidence that something has broken down so horribly. And today, an institution of criminal justice held. Today, justice held. Today, justice worked. Today, Derek Chauvin was judged by a jury of his peers, and they came out with guilty, guilty, guilty. And I think we should take this moment and, you know, there's that idea of let's love what remains. And so that's the first thing, because there's so much repair work that needs to be done. But today we saw that America can repair itself. Um, that that one system did hold today. And so I think that it's, for me, it was very emotional. I think for a lot of people that was very emotional. And as far as um, disabled, as you said, there are, there are the disabilities of the physical self, there are the disabilities of the, of the mental self, the emotional self. 
but I think that this is a very wounded time. Uh, most people are carrying wounds of some kind. But I think the spirit is not wounded. The spirit is whole. And I think that that which matters most about you uh, doesn't have to do with your physical eyesight. And if you're going through this challenge with your physical eyesight, we're all going to be there for you and you're going to get that equipment. And what you are uh, losing, at least temporarily, on a level of the physical, you are gaining on the level of compassion for those you never thought before. I know I, I had surgery this year and for two months afterwards, I was in excruciating pain. I mean, so excruciating. I was on Oxycontin, Dilaudid, Percocet, everything you can imagine, still yelling out in pain, having to be rushed to the hospital for morphine. Well, I never knew before. I mean, I knew, but I didn't know. So I have a compassion now for people. I, and I learned from that experience. Thousands of people in this country go to work with chronic pain every day. And you were talking about Medicare for all. That's one of the things about people who, whose insurance won't cover pain meds, et cetera. So I think that you have already demonstrated, you know, when you were telling your story on the Katie Halper show, you, you know, you couldn't have heard a pin drop. So what you lost, then look at what you gained and what you were able to transmit to all of us with your compassion, with your wisdom, with your power. So I don't choose to see you as disabled by your disability. I choose to see you as strengthened in many ways by your disability. And um, I'm a woman of faith. I feel in God, something like that just has nothing to do with undermining, undercutting, or diminishing in any way uh, who you are, what you are, what you have to give. And I think you even have more to give now. And we have more to hear from you now. And all of us as Americans, I think, are developing those deeper regions of our power of our compassion, of our wisdom. And we all have different trials and different challenges, but they're all taking us to the same place. And that is greater compassion and greater strength that we're all gonna need for the days ahead. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, Mike, do you wanna go? Sure. Uh, I mean, following up after Mary. Yeah, I mean, is, like, wait, wait. Thanks, Joy. Um, you, like, thank you, Joy. Go ahead. <laughs> thanks, no. Joy. I, 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 <laughs> like, you want me to go after Mary? Okay. No, um, I, I do want to add to that because I, I think that what she said is so, so important. But, Joy, I do, I hope that you'll see this as like more than just Joy because what you're doing, like, what you've, demonstrated to folks with your with your speech and whatnot and just the fact that you're going still and you're not quitting that is so important because think about how many people who are in a similar situation who are blind visually impaired and they think i can't do this i can't do that and so rather than letting this be the thing that defines you you kept going and that really is super super important because for people to have um individuals persevere who's in a similar struggle that honestly it has it has such a huge impact i can't even tell you it's why i'm always advocating you know we we need to see trans representation in media and lgbtq allies uh women women of color because until you see other people like yourself it, it's really hard to to value yourself you know so so you're really you're kind of a trailblazer here in the sense that nobody else in any media has done this a lot of folks would have checked out but the fact that you're still going in and of itself is a victory and it's a victory that isn't just about joy it's about anyone who is uh, disabled and thought about giving up like it truly is monumental and i don't i don't want to um i don't want that to be lost here because it's important that you're still going thank you speaking of trans uh, uh representation please check out all of you maybe a girl who is running against uh, Adam Schiff. Yes. Yes. He's awesome. Angeles. And we, yes. Need a yes. we need yes. a drag queen in Congress. <laughs> yes. So I hope you are have her on. She's really quite something. I love Maybe. Yeah, Maybe's awesome. She's been on my show before, and, and I guess probably all your alls as well. But, but yeah, she is awesome. And Adam Schiff is the worst. So. <laughs> Lucy. Is that wrong? Lucy gives her encouragement. Lucy gives oh, her thanks, Lucy. Lucy uh, makes is it my turn. Do I, do I do the? Is it my closing thing or? 
Yeah. What okay. do you want uh, the viewers to take away? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm going to try to make sure Lucy doesn't fade out into the background here, but because she, uh, she clearly, she sends her love joy. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, first of all, Mar Marianne, thank you so much for, for bringing up uh, Derek Chauvin. It, it's been a very emotional day for uh, not just the United States, but I mean, really the whole world uh, was watching this. And, uh, and, and I'm not even trying to be funny when I say this, I'm actually being sincere. I think this might be the first time in my lifetime where the world was watching the United States and we did not shit the bed. Um, so, so that's, um, that's encouraging. I mean, we still, I mean, this was a moment of relief. And um, and hopefully the sentence is, is the sentence it, it should be. I, I guess we're going to find out in a couple months here. Um, and there is still the reality that we do have a very long way to go, um, you know, especially since, you know, something happened in Columbus uh, a few hours later. And so uh, we do still have a very, very long way to go. And uh, the systemic rot is still there. But this is. What I hope is is that today is the catalyst towards a better tomorrow. That today is more than just one ruling. That today is a start because the the one thing that that I think uh, is reason for some optimism here is this is the first time, at least the first time I'm I'm aware of where the trial happened when he was still in the public eye and the anger and the frustration, justifiable anger and frustration was still there. See, before they, they would just wait long enough. So enough cycles would pass and it was out of the public's eye um, when and then they would have the trial. And, and we all none of us were born yesterday. We all know this is by design. This wasn't just, oh, the wheels of justice are slow. It's the system. No, this was by design to let cops get away with this stuff. But this is the first time where they weren't able to do that. And the public was looking. And so I hope this is a catalyst for a better tomorrow. I, I really do. And, and Joy, um, yeah, first of all, I, I love having you every month. I look forward to the last Tuesday every month. It, it is awesome. And, uh, and, and I'm so glad that, um, you know, that, that Lucy is so she really does not want to be. She's like, I, I want to say, Joy's great. Joy, you're great. Joy, I'm so happy for you. And everybody support Joy. Support Joy. This is important. We're coming together. Joy's show is great. I'm a big fan. She's funnier than Ron. Ron's all that of his accurate. anecdotes are stale. I'm just, <laughs> I, I, I humor him because he feeds me. <laughs> meow. I say meow, he says peace. That's the, I say peace too. I'm a very anti-war cat, but he always <laughs> gives me the meow. There you go. <laughs> I want to say something to something you just said before you go on and, and, and talk to Joy. Uh, and, and that's kudos to Keith Ellison, because I think Keith Ellison it, it drove it and made sure that it would happen fast enough. And for them to do a prosecution that was that excellent, that fast enough, that's Keith Ellison. And, and it was difficult for you know him winning that race. Once again, it's who we elect. It's who we elect. Mm -hmm. It's who we elect. Absolutely. Um, everyone, I cannot... Uh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Because I, I interrupted Ron when he was just about to say all these incredible things about you. So... I didn't mean to cut off the marble. No, no, no. Okay. No, no, no. It's, it's good. Okay. Yeah. Lucy Ooh, got it all in there. Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> she just, did Lucy just do what I think she did, Ron? Oh, no. She wants to play. This is why, oh. again, this is why... <laughs> I mean, you can see it in real time. So this is what she wants. Oh, Here she okay. goes. Now I'm like, is Lucy acting out? I've never seen Lucy act out. Oh, she's happy as a clam now. You can't see her because she's on the floor. But now she's running around <laughs> chasing the laser pointer. And this oh. is what she wanted the whole time. Oh, my goodness. Duchess. This animal. Duchess. That's a beautiful oh. dog. Hi. <laughs> she's so pretty. <laughs> Animal Appreciation Show. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who's watching, everyone who's donated, um, you all for, for joining and for being so supportive. Stop crying. <laughs> um, so because of the donations you guys have uh, raised, I am able to keep doing my show. So, 
that is like the best thing ever <laughs> to me um because i love it and it's what gets me out of bed in the morning and um so yeah i can keep going and it, and it's thanks to all of your kindness and your donations and and everything so i'm looking forward to uh be getting all the equipment i need now um so i i, I honestly can't thank you all enough um it means everything that you believe in me um enough to make this happen so Thank you. I love you all so much. We love you. Um, and thank you, you to my, my wonderful guests um, and Pat, Andy, and Jenna for helping me with the video clips. <laughs> thank you again, uh, Marianne, Mike, and Ron. You guys were great. And uh, love you, Joy. You're awesome. We love you. Love it's you. great to be with you guys. Oz and Joy and Mike and Ron, so wonderful being with all of you. Yes. And let yes. us know if you need anything more, make sure that you let the community know because I know we all want to be there for you, Joe, Joy, if you need mm -hmm. anything more. Thank you so much. Much love to all of you. God bless you guys. Take wonderful care. being with you. Bye. Care, everyone. Bye bye.